In the early 17th century, the British Isles were engulfed by bitter religious and political conflict. The people divided into two warring tribes. The Roundheads, radical parliamentarians led by Oliver Cromwell, fighting to create a more egalitarian church and state. And the Cavaliers, royalists led by Charles I, fighting to preserve the political and religious hierarchy and the king's authority. The conflict came to a head in civil war that would revolutionize the culture and politics of Britain. It shattered a unified society forever. And ever since then, we've had essentially some kind of two-party system. The division of Roundhead and Cavalier got perpetuated in many ways into Whig and Tory, liberal and conservative, conservative and socialist. The Civil War was more than a battle for political power. It was also a struggle between two conflicting attitudes to life. And that struggle continues to this day. I think we subconsciously divide ourselves into roundheads and cavaliers. It's not a, a mark of wealth, it's not a question of class distinction, it's a sort of cast of mind. The cavalier is flamboyant, a person of the grand gesture, they're not particularly interested in the nitty gritty of organising um, uh, life and, and politics. They probably don't have an over, a huge overall plan. Rather vainglorious but also terribly affable and very friendly. Beautiful, beautiful style, um, not much substance. Roundheads, I would say, more austere, more careful, more organised. Doer, godly, sincere, determined, thoughtful. People of principle, people of purpose. Very militant, um, power hungry, um, rebellious. The battle between Roundheads and Cavaliers continues to shape our national life. In architecture, in the press, on the sports field, and in the kitchen. To understand the origins of this great divide is to understand what it means to be British. Prepare to march. March on. August bank holiday. Godalming in Surrey. And the sealed knot, the roundheads and cavaliers of 21st century Britain, are on the march. Charge the horse! They regularly gather to recreate battles from a civil war that forged our national character. Very definitely pleased to say that I'm a royalist and very definitely a cavalier as well. Cavalier means that a gentleman of the royalist rank, really. I'm around it and I'm proud of it. Parliament for me. One voice, one people, one vote. Without it, where we be today? We'd all be living in the gutter. King still be living in castles. The first people to be called Roundheads were bands of apprentices rioting in London in 1641 in protest against the power of the King and the Church of England. Roundheads is a name that's appeared out of the blue almost. There was a, a short-lived fashion for people, parliamentarians and Puritans in particular, to wear their hair very short. And this made their heads look almost naked and, and, and bald or round, and the name stuck, even though the fashion itself did not last very long. The Roundheads were campaigning for a radical transformation of Britain's political and religious hierarchy. Radical Puritans had, in their day, a very advanced view of equality. That view came from their religious beliefs, where they were all equal before God. They were all going to be saved. And if they were all equal in religion, they should be equal in politics. And so the religion fed into the political demands. The Cavaliers were determined to stop this puritanical roundhead revolution. 
Cavaliers were fighting to protect the authority of the king and to protect the, the old established Church of England. And they saw the Roundheads as fanatics, essentially, who would bring down the church, bring down the state, and bring down law and order itself. The origin of the term cavalier comes from the Spanish caballero, and it's used particularly to identify royalists. Royalist courtiers on horsebacks, with their swords, with their honour code. And as the propaganda campaign kicks off, it also has connotations of drunkenness, rowdy behaviour, and can be used also as an insult, as well as a way of identifying the enemy. As the conflict spread across the British Isles, the two tribes expressed their political and religious differences in the way they dressed. Cavaliers were flamboyant and extravagant. Some even sported ribbons on their codpieces. Roundheads valued simplicity and modesty as signs of godliness. Puritan seeing someone dressed in fine silk clothes showed exactly how morally degraded they were. A Puritan believed that you displayed your own moral integrity by quiet, modest dress. So seeing those individuals in courts full of their fine silks really exposed their fundamental moral depravity. <laughs> The War of the Wardrobes was fought out in sharply worded pamphlets, precursors of the newspaper. One Puritan pamphlet raged against the Cavalier's long hair, the unloveliness of Lovelocks. John Lilburn, a radical roundhead and pamphleteer, was a model for the Puritan values of modesty and restraint. John Lilburn had an engraving done of him and it promoted this image of the man in plain clothes, in black dress, unadorned, plain, just a little bit of rough collar and a very simple hairstyle, the sort of the classic round head with a few curls around the ears. The Cavaliers defended their exuberant exhibitionism with pamphlets of their own. And it wasn't just the men. There's one wonderful pamphlet by a woman denouncing what she called the ill-bred plebeian zealotry of Puritans and insisting that it was entirely up to women to wear hair as long as they liked, uh, to wear um, beauty spots and cosmetics, and denounced religion as just as fickle as fashion had ever been. The English Civil War dropped a pebble into our pond, and those ripples keep coming, keep coming. Let's get to it, strike a pose, there's nothing to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. I think if we look at modern fashion, then obviously a sense of permissiveness and uh, pleasure in glamour and extravagance has won out, so the Cavaliers have definitely won. I do think the exposure which goes on on our streets at the moment is plain immodest. And I did used to say to some of the girls on Strictly, say, are you feeling a bit cold? Because they weren't really wearing very much, and I do disapprove. Uh, and I do think that people should conduct themselves modestly. I mean, just the sense of disapproval of everything still happens today. The, the idea that dressing up is wrong, anything indulgent is wrong. It's about distracting you away from your core value, which, you know, for obviously for, for uh, uh, the Roundheads was God, was, it, was religion. In the early 1640s, the Roundheads stepped up their parliamentary campaign for democratic reform of church and state. But the Cavaliers refused to compromise the supremacy of the monarchy. By the summer of 1642, their differences are irreconcilable. They can only be decided on the field of war by the use of the sword. And that's what happens. Both Parliament and the King set up their standards in August of 1642, and the English Civil War is underway. 
On October the 23rd, 1642, at Edge Hill in Warwickshire, Roundhead and Cavalier armies faced each other for the first time. The King's cavalry were crack troops led by his nephew, the 23-year-old Prince Rupert of the Rhine, one of the most experienced cavalry commanders in Europe. He was the very image of a cavalier. He was so dashing, he was definitely romantic. And I loved the fact that he used to ride into battle with his standard poodle, which the parliamentary forces thought was his familiar running along beside him. And how do you train a poodle to take somebody's throat out if they're trying to hamstring your horse? I don't really know. This is the saddle belonging to Prince Rupus the Ryan. An extremely posh saddle. The most expensive accessory which a household can have is tapestry. And this is a miniature piece of tapestry. It's also extremely comfortable by the standards of saddles of that day and most. Instead of the usual hard leather thing, what you have here is velvet plush, really deep, maximum comfort. At Edge Hill, Rupert launched the Cavalier's secret weapon, a manoeuvre he'd learnt on the battlefields of Europe. The Thunderbolt Charge. You hear the sound of thousands and thousands of horses' hooves striking the ground around you at once, and it's louder than thunder. It's an extraordinary cacophony of noise which sweeps you along with it, as finally the counter turns into the all-out charge. Horses encourage each other, so as one moves faster, the whole mass begins to go, and it's rather like something being released from a bow or from a gun. Prince Rupert knew the shock value of cavalry. He went straight in and hard. He knew if he broke the enemy cavalry, they would never reform. He could then dominate the field. The Cavalier Thunderbolts scattered the Roundhead cavalry. But then Prince Rupert and his high-spirited horsemen continued charging. Off the battlefield and toward the Roundhead encampment. And one of the most glorious things about old-fashioned warfare is your ability to loot the defeated enemy. And here in the wagons were not just the foodstuffs and the drink and the cloth for the ordinary soldiers, but all the valuables of the officers. And so what Rupert's troopers did was set about plundering for hours. Behind them, the battle was largely being lost. The Cavaliers' lack of self-discipline allowed the Roundheads to regain the initiative. As darkness fell, the Battle of Edge Hill ended in stalemate. Cavaliers don't do self-discipline at all. That's the, the, the absolute antithesis of cavalier thought is self-control. It's all about letting it go, you know, about just enjoying the moment. It's carpe diem, it's gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Um, all of that kind of stuff. A cavalier person, in a way, reflects cavalier principles, which are, they don't care too much. They are there for the moment. They are dazzling rather than detailed. They are, they are there to entertain and, and, uh, and to move life along, but they're not there really to do the nitty gritty. Over the next three years, as the Civil War swept through the country, the radical parliamentarian Oliver Cromwell emerged as the Roundhead's most effective military leader. Open your order from the centre! In 1644, he began building Britain's first full-time professional fighting force. Port your pike! The new model army. Double your files! It became a showcase for the Roundhead values of godliness and discipline. Stop. Without discipline, you, you get nowhere in life, and, it, and that's very true of today, never mind the 17th century. Well, you think this is your birthday, don't you, Josh? You have to have discipline. You have to have order. 
and Cromwell was very good at instilling order into his troops. We believe work hard and play hard. Rupert's, it wouldn't be unfair to say Rupert's believe play hard and play a bit harder. So that's, that's the main difference between the two units. Discipline was absolutely essential. And we know that the parliamentary troops were far better disciplined. Everything from drunkenness and fornication being punished severely. The penalty for blasphemy was particularly severe. Somebody who was a persistent blasphemer would have his tongue drawn out of his mouth with pincers and bored through with a red-hot iron. So he, got, he ended up with a hole in his tongue. Cromwell now set out to improve the performance of the Roundhead Cavalry. He trained them and trained them and trained them until they would charge home, the Thunderbolt charge, like Prince Rupert's men, but they would, after the charge, regroup, return to the battlefield, and be good for another charge. And that, of course, was a tremendous advance. The Roundheads also introduced a military uniform for the first time. The famous red coat, worn by the British Army for the next two centuries. The new model army recruited according to military competence, not aristocratic birthright. Britain's feudal hierarchy was being replaced by the newly emerging Roundhead state. You have new institutions, the Committee for the Army, the Committee for the Navy, and so the, the state bureaucracy is inevitably increasing um, to a size that previously unheard of. I think a good case can be made that the modern state really begins in the 1640s with the Civil War and with these new bureaucratic institutions. Roundhead bureaucracy introduced a new spirit of professionalism into British life that still endures. You know, we work all the hours that God sends, and then if you don't die of a heart attack, you might make a nice profit in your old age when you're too old to enjoy it. Certainly that, that cavalier joy, as, you, um, as it's called, um, has gone when it comes to our attitude to work. We, we definitely become the roundhead state. Undoubtedly, there is a more austere and professional attitude in, in British life. The great cult of the amateur, the great cult of the eccentric, the person who's sort of organised life from the seat of their pants, has rather gone, I think. I think we, we certainly do expect people to have a plan and to stick to it and to understand the detail of the machine. Deep in the Cavalier heartlands of modern Britain, the cult of the amateur lives on. Well, Henley, of course, started as the regatta in 1839, and amateur sport was absolutely at the heart of it. There was something fundamental about the way in which you looked at sport. The amateur was not all about winning, it was the playing the part. It was about the whole man. The professional was about the prize. Ready for the contest, boys? Come on, come on. The power, it's all dying on you. I'm more cavalier, cavalier, sir. Cavalier, cavalier, sir. cavalier, sir. cavalier attitude and manners. Cavalier. And that's all about team spirit, enjoying yourself, and it's not about winning, it's just about taking part. The buttonholes at the Veterans National Flower Day competition would humble any 17th century dandy. These are uh, calla lilies, uh, Asiatic lily, and uh, these strelitzia, the, the bird of paradise, flying in and, and taking nectar from it. This is plucked from the garden this morning. These are all hand-reared and smelling delightful. 
But even in this cavalier stronghold, there's been a roundhead incursion. Two British Olympic hopes, Andy Triggs Hodge and Pete Reed, have brought roundhead professionalism onto the water. Rowing is 24 hours a day for us. I, I pressurise myself enough in training to make sure I'm improving on a daily basis. I feel that's a, a, a decent roundhead sort of attitude, and it's finding anything we can do. So it's the, you know, it's all the little things that help you through the day. So if you can reduce the amount of hours you drive, if you can sleep longer, the quality of your bed, I mean, it all makes a difference. So it's applying how we execute our finest two kilometer race in the Olympic Games and how every little bit of life affects that in the four years prior. At the end of the day, it's, it is all about winning. But Olympic success still calls for a touch of the old cavalier spirit. When I get on the water, there's got to be a, a bit of me which is a bit a bit loose, you know, a bit of a loose cannon, and you just got to go out and do crazy things because if you don't, you'll never you'll never achieve your uh, your, your personal best. So. I think it's fascinating the way that most sports teams require a combination of roundhead and cavalier. Um, the England rugby team, for example, requires the roundhead Johnny Wilkinson to kick the ball through the post with kind of metronomic efficiency. It also needs those kind of extraordinary flamboyant figures on the wing who can suddenly carve through. And it's, I think it's the same of all sports teams. Perhaps it's true of all teams. You need a boycott, but you also need to have a Kevin Peterson. On June the 14th, 1645, roundhead discipline was put to the test at Naseby in Northamptonshire. The new model army prepared to confront the Cavalier forces. Prince Rupert began the battle with another thunderbolt charge. At Naseby, Prince Rupert was on the royalist right wing. He charged and simply scattered the parliamentary left wing, but made the same mistake as at Edge Hill. His men scattered off in all directions, plundered the baggage train, and were not much use for the rest of the battle. Cromwell's new well-drilled cavalry were now ready to be deployed with devastating effect. On the right wing, Cromwell charged home, scattered the royalist left wing, and then got his men to come to the assistance of the cavalry, and then charge into the flank of the royalist infantry and win the Battle of Naseby. Naseby annihilates the king's own army. It destroys a body of men he'd built up over three years, and he never manages to rebuild it. It is the knockout blow of the English Civil War. By October 1647, the king was imprisoned and the cavaliers were in disarray. Roundhead forces were camped just outside the capital, here in Putney. The more radical roundheads were now demanding their reward, a more equal society. They became known as the levelers. These people wanted reform of the law, religious toleration, reform of election procedure. They wanted the soldiers who'd fought for Parliament to be rewarded in some way. These were not mercenaries. These were, in the language of the day, developing citizens. Second colour, yes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Right. It is going to be second colour, though. We'll sort, we'll sort that yeah. right. No, we'll sort that Today, the 21st century roundheads are following tradition by voting for their commanding officer. The one of us, you've got the one, the one you've a voice. Like. It's important to have, like, democracy because the royalists, they had dictatorship and it didn't work. Aye. 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 Inspired by radicals like John Lilburn, the Levellers published their demands for human rights and democratic reform in a manifesto called The Agreement of the People. It's a radical vision of England. It's an England, eventually, in which he would like to see a greater extension in democracy, voting rights for certain men, men, uh, not women, one should add, not servants, not beggars. Religious toleration, this is the type of England that Lilburn would like to see. It was a fascinating and fabulous moment in British history. The Levellers 
by the agreement of the people were proposing a bill of rights that would give individuals, autonomous individuals, certain rights against government. And so uh, that is a very important, profoundly important idea today. But the Roundhead forces were divided. Even a committed parliamentarian like Cromwell feared that the leveller's egalitarian demands would lead to anarchy. For 13 days, here in the church of St Mary in Putney, the two sides took part in a great debate about the future of the nation. The position of the generals was put by Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ireton, who said the vote should be restricted to those who traditionally had it, to the people who had a stake in the country, who owned a piece of land. From his point of view, this was only right and proper. Why should you have a say in government if you don't own anything, if you're poor? If you're beholden to a people who are more powerful than you, they will influence the way that you vote. This is a profound moment. There had been popular rebellions before in English history. These had been about particular issues, food, taxation, but not about a right to have a say in how government is chosen. The levellers began a debate about citizenship and democracy that continues in modern Britain and across the world. It was John Lilburn who said famously that although we may die, our ideas will live on and it will be for later generations to implement them. And after all, this is what we're about today. I always laugh about the conservatives who uh, dismiss the European uh, Convention on Human Rights because it goes back to these times when torture was abolished, when religious freedom comparatively was permitted, when parliament was sovereign, when we were working out democracy. These rights go back to Cromwell and the Levellers who argued them in this little Putney church. With the king in prison, the Roundheads could now set about moulding the nation in their own image. But playful cavalier traditions were deeply rooted in British life. Give me an O! Oh! Give me an N! Yeah! Give me an I! Oh! Give me an O! Oh! Give me an N! Yeah! Give me an o! Here in Newent, Gloucestershire, the Roundhead struggle to crush the town's cavalier spirit has never been forgotten. There's still remains of the Cavalier Roundhead rivalry, um, Gloucester being a, a Roundhead stronghold and the rural area surrounding, including Newham being Cavalier. There was fighting going on, there was great battles, there was actually a uh, battle around here and it can take hundreds of years for that to wear off. Every year, the people of Newent reaffirm their Cavalier spirit with the pleasures of the 850-year-old Onion Fair. The climax of this festival is the World Onion Eating Championship. Put your hands in the air when you finish lunch and open your mouths for the judges. I've been practicing nearly all week. This is the uh, fourth year now, I've won it. That was my slowest time ever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. See you all again. Hopefully next year. Thank you. I've got to be Cavalier, without a doubt. But you've only got to look at today. The party atmosphere, the fun everybody's having. I couldn't imagine that under Cromwell. <laughs> Puritans were not really in favour of fun. The Puritans felt that a lot of popular behaviour was, was bad, bad for the people themselves, even if they liked doing it. And their approach was to do what was good for the people, not necessarily what the people merely wanted. But the Roundheads were confronted by a pleasure-loving people, and they were never happier than when they were getting drunk. Puritans pretty much find drunkenness a despicable form of immodesty. 
Drunkenness allows your sins to come to the fore. Drunkenness means you're out of control and you can't act in a godly way. So for, for the Puritan, the alehouses are these great sites of sinfulness and have to be policed and disciplined. I don't know what makes the English a nation of binge drinkers. There is something about the inhabitants of this island which means that we want to drink too much and not just sort of then get amusing with it, but actually pick a fight with it. And of course, the, the, the roundheads were terribly disapproving about alcohol because it is fundamentally pretty antisocial. Drunken British people are absolutely appalling. Where the Cavaliers have won is that I think most of the... Um, British population, whatever their political beliefs actually, uh, feel they have the right to get drunk if they want to. They have the right to eat what they want even if it makes them fat. They have the right not to go for a run. You know, that's their business. They're perfectly happy with the government saying you can't get drunk and then drive. That's, that's absolutely fine. But not you can't get drunk. And perhaps that's the line between Roundhead and Cavalier. In 1648, the Roundheads turned their attention to one of the most popular forms of public entertainment, the theatre. Parliament issued an order for the utter suppression and abolishing of all stage plays. Puritans were very suspicious of the theatre and almost everything involved with it. Um, they thought some of the plots were dealing with unsuitable subjects, you know, violence or bawdy comedy, they didn't like that. They strongly disapproved of the actors, the fact that all the female roles were taken by young boys in drag, essentially. And they said the emotions that were being created on stage were, of course, artificial and false emotions. That was bad. And finally, they disapproved of the audiences, the fact that different ages and sexes were jumbled together and that theatres attracted pickpockets and prostitutes. The Roundhead mission to control the people's pleasures unleashed a culture war between high-minded Puritans and populist cavaliers. It continues to this day. Oh, the Cavalier culture has absolutely won out as far as the arts go and um, it is sort of pushing out high art by popular art. I feel deeply oppressed by what I see when I run through the programmes on the television. Oh, watch it! What I suspect about the drama is that, is that it's facile mostly, it's designed to please. Um, it knows it has to please the greatest possible number of the population. Oh, that dirty, disgusting monster! It's a kind of run of repeated gestures and repeated emotions <laughs> which people satisfy themselves on, like um, sausage in a bun or um, <laughs> um, ice cream. <sighs> and those things are OK, but too much of them isn't good for your life, I feel, being, being a roundhead. Oh. <laughs> I think this is a very old contest between uh, the roundhead critic of frivolity and the cavalier enjoyer of it. Welcome to Downton. Lady Grantham, this is so kind of you. Not at all, Duke. We're delighted you could spare the time. Very popular shows of any kind bring out a sort of anger uh, among a certain kind of journalist and I don't know whether, what it is quite. Uh, sometimes you could say it's envy of their, the fact that their message is reaching so few and this other message which they consider worthless is reaching so many. I think that may be uh, a good part of it, but certainly there is um, a roundhead anger at the, the extent of popular culture's reach. Um, but I don't think that's ever going to change. Mama, may I present Matthew Crawley and Mrs Crawley, my mother, Lady Grantham? What should we call each other? Well, we could always start with Mrs Crawley and Lady Grantham. 
As the Puritan Revolution unfolded, the Roundhead Parliament was still being challenged by cavaliers demanding the king's release from prison. In 1649, Cromwell took action to assert Parliament's supremacy. He put the king on trial for treason and war crimes against the people. Putting the king on trial was, was almost inconceivable. It, it is unthinkable. Kings have been killed on, on the battlefield, kings have been assassinated. But trying a monarch, a divinely appointed king, the power that exists by God's authority, trying a king by authority of the people is almost unprecedented. On the morning of January the 20th, 1649, Charles I was marched into Westminster Hall. Up to 10,000 people watched as the Roundhead Solicitor General John Cook and his team prepared to make legal history. What they do is make an argument that separates the office of the king from the person of the king. And what they are prosecuting is a willful, wicked tyrant, an individual, not a king. Everyone was aware of what an ominous moment it was and what an iconic moment it was in British history. It was the symbol of the end of absolute power. And there's a telling moment. This is the king, a man who's used to having his every whim served. At some point, the silver top of his cane falls off and rolls to the floor. The king expects somebody else to pick it up, but he's instructed to pick it up himself. And at that little moment, I think we can see the theater of power that's going on. These days, we've found a way to put heads of state on trial uh, for a particularly heinous crime, a crime against humanity, uh, against which their immunity does not operate. And so Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, Charles Taylor, Karadich, and so forth will be prosecuted on the basis that John Cook took the first uh, nervous step to bring down uh, an all-powerful head of state, namely uh, on the grounds of uh, their commission of a crime against humanity, a crime against their own people. After a seven-day trial, the king was found guilty. He would be executed here, outside the banqueting hall of Whitehall Palace. So, January the 30th, just before two o'clock, a very nervous, anxious Charles I stepped out onto the scaffold, having said farewell to his family. And a few moments later, the axe fell. <laughs> around the gathered crowd. People uh, reacted by fainting, women miscarried. And there's tremendous horror. But that horror reverberated around the kingdom. It was as if uh, a great cataclysm in a sense of order had happened, like the Twin Towers, like those planes smashing into them. There's a sudden horror and chaos. The Roundheads now abolished the monarchy and the House of Lords an English Republic was established. The Roundhead Revolution intensified. The King had encouraged the installation of ornate stained glass windows in churches all over the country. The Roundheads were now determined to smash them as they imposed their own austere form of Protestantism. Charles loved ritual, he loved beauty, he loved holiness as a sort of experience that brought someone closer to God, whereas Puritans loved the idea of plain, unadorned, simple, no stained glass in their churches. In 1651, the Roundheads went into action here, at Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford. The orders from the newly installed dean are written in the church records. All pictures representing God, good or bad angels or saints, shall be forthwith taken down out of our church windows. 
Well, when the windows were taken out, they were laid out on the floor, and one of the canons who was appointed by Cromwell was so against them being preserved that he furiously stamped up and down on it, destroying most of the glass. Only one out of the 20 stained glass windows survived the roundhead assault. Perhaps because it contains a powerful roundhead message. The prophet Jonah is on his way to warn the people of Nineveh that they must give up the pleasures of the flesh or face the wrath of God. It's fantastic. I think it's got so much more detail than any other stained glass window in the cathedral. And every time you look at it, you see something new, and there's always something that sticks out that you've never seen before. For centuries, the smashed stained glass windows were thought to have been totally destroyed. But 13 years ago, the verger spotted something in a pile of rubbish that was being cleared out of a coal hole. It was like uh, discovering buried treasure. It was, uh, it was amazing. I think, uh, you know, what have I found? <laughs> if you look at the glass without light behind it, it, it looks just like a piece of slate almost. But then when I shown it to the, uh, shown it to the light, this is the first piece of glass I found. And uh, you can imagine my surprise. <laughs> Probably most likely got Christ disputing with the doctors of divinity, and all we have here are some of the, the doctors in that scene. And the central figure, which would have been Christ, would have been um, destroyed at the time. So it's very unlikely that there would be any, any images of Christ left. Stop in 1653, Cromwell was confirmed as Head of State, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland. His government intruded ever more deeply into people's lives and passed a law to make Sunday a day of worship and quiet contemplation. Sunday, should be hanging out with the guys, having a good time, drinking a few drinks, watching some football. There are enough yeah. things we're not allowed to do during the rest of the week, so we deserve to do something we want to do on a Sunday. Definitely not sitting in church and thinking. The Puritans wanted the whole of the Lord's Day, as they call it, to be devoted to religion alone, exclusively, and they pushed, pushed through a series of ordinances and parliamentary acts, banning all the things of which they disapproved, so that every conceivable activity, pretty well, was prohibited. Hundreds of activities were banned. It was forbidden to ride a horse, sit on your own threshold, or even to knit on a Sunday. Where Puritans were in control locally, they enforced these restrictions very tightly indeed. And one remarkable case, in a village not far from here, Barnsley in Gloucestershire, uh, two village women were put in the stocks merely for having gone for a Sunday afternoon stroll, even though they had already attended two church services already that morning. Roundhead values would define the British Sunday well into the 20th century. Strict licensing laws, shops closed, no sporting fixtures, an obligatory day of rest. Sunday, without a doubt, the worst day of the week. And everything was shut and the transport didn't run very much. You were not allowed to do anything. Church in the morning, walk to the zoo, wow. Sunday lunch, nothing. And my father said he had to read books about the holy deaths of little children. And the little children would lie in their beds and die. And the angels would come down and take them to heaven. And my father said it was absolutely awful. But this was how it was. Just like hell. So I can't really support Cromwell and the repression of Sunday sports. In 
In August 1994, the Sunday Shopping Act brought 300 years of Roundhead Sundays to an end. I think if our Roundhead forebears could see what we've done to Sundays, they'd be spinning in their graves like fury. You can hear their, their bucket top boots hitting the top of the coffin lids like this. Because we have 100% ruined Sunday um, uh, compared to, to, to everything that they believed in. I would like uh, Sunday to be a quiet day. I would like everything to stop on a Sunday as it used to, for people to be able to spend the days with their families, uh, for the church bells to ring out across the land, uh, and for there to be an active interest in church. That is what I would like to see. Um, it's not what I'm going to see in my lifetime. We fear Sunday, I think. That's the problem that we've got, is we fear Sunday because it is uh, a void. You know, we're not, uh, if we're not careful, we might have to sit still, be quiet and think about stuff. And this is the thing that none of us let ourselves do anymore. And of course, for the Puritans, that's exactly what you should do on a Sunday. You should uh, use it as an opportunity to explore your mind, explore your spirituality. <laughs> Sunday had now been claimed for the Roundheads. At the same time, they also passed a law to abolish the celebration of Christmas. Puritans strongly disapproved of Christmas. They pointed out there was no evidence that Christ was born on that particular day. They pointed out too that it had its origins as a pagan midwinter festival. And they strongly disapproved of the fact that it had been turned into a general occasion for feasting, merrymaking, drinking, general profanity. All those things were, were wrong in their eyes. How miserable can you be? How miserable can you be that you do away with Christmas? That should, that, that should say it all about Oliver Cromwell. I don't know how people can admire Cromwell. Have a holly jolly Christmas It's the best time of the year I don't know if there'll be snow But have a... The Cavaliers fought back. They circulated pamphlets attacking the Puritan assault on the old Christmas. People hated the fact that Christmas was abolished and even more they hated the idea that they were supposed to treat it simply as another working day. And for the most part, they refused to accept that new regulation. Despite the full force of the Roundhead state, Cromwell failed to crush the cavalier spirit of Christmas. What you see now is a Christmas which is almost entirely pagan. Bringing in Christmas trees, giving of gifts, lighting candles, all of that. Uh, this, is, this is the very, very much older history that Cromwell couldn't eliminate. Well, the Roundheads have been absolutely defeated on Christmas. I think Jesus may have been defeated on Christmas. It's like a cavalry charge, and it's every man for himself. You have to be an adrenaline junkie to do it. You really do. In the early 21st century, there was a new standoff between Roundheads and Cavaliers. In 2004, demonstrators invaded Parliament to protest against the passing of the Hunting Act, which outlawed hunting foxes with hounds. And the two tribes went to war once more. I think very much that those of us who support hunting see themselves, and probably rightly, as the descendants of the Cavaliers. Certainly the, the rank and file of the parliamentarians, if they were alive today, they'd be hunt saboteurs. The Atherston hunt in Leicestershire is one of the oldest in Britain. A loophole in the law permits them to continue running with hounds, but only if a bird of prey is used for the kill. Parliament has set out to ban hunting, and that makes us a criminal. Should we kill a fox, we are a criminal. 
here we are. There's absolutely loads of kit in this little bag, from hats to gloves to nets. Members of the League Against Cruel Sports are now keeping close watch on hunts across Britain. If the hunt is breaking the law, then with a bit of luck we'll get good evidence to catch them possibly with their pants down, you know, by being hidden. I think it's important that Parliament's will is upheld simply because if you believe in democracy, the law is the law, and if we start choosing which law we want to abide by, then we will soon slip into anarchy and civil unrest. A roundhead Britain, haven't we just lived through it? People being told what they can and cannot do, limitations on all our activities, and I don't just mean hunting, there are plenty of other activities that were um, limited by Mr Blair and his friends. I'm afraid I think that modern Britain is decidedly rented because I measure that by how much intrusion do we have from the state in our daily lives. Oh, and they try to protect us against ourselves like very good roundheads. Play conkers, you must put goggles on. Uh, don't do the backstroke in swimming baths in case you crack your dear little head at the end of it. All with the force of law. Oh, Cromwell would have loved it. He would have loved it. For all men and women of goodwill, and especially for thy servant Oliver Cromwell, we give thee thanks, O God, for all associated with him in the struggle for liberty, justice, and truth. We give thee thanks, O God. Oliver Cromwell ruled as Lord Protector for nearly five years, until his death on September the 3rd, 1658. Every year on this day, the Cromwell Association gathers to mark the anniversary. Cromwell is one of the, the Great Britons, and indeed at the end of the last millennium when they had various polls, he did make the top ten, he didn't come first unfortunately, but he is one of the formative influences in English and British history, for good and ill. He's still a controversial person. He should still be remembered. Cromwell was a great man, a greatly great man. He bestrides English history like a colossus. I mean, the, <laughs> the time of his rule is usually whited out because he's the only non-royal, uh, which makes him, of course, uh, enormously important and infinitely superior to, uh, to any of the, the royals. I have no instincts towards vandalism at all, except when I pass Oliver Cromwell's statue outside the House of Commons, and I dearly wish I could push it over. The conflict goes on, but even the Cromwell Association has called a truce with the monarchy. We pray for our Queen and for all who are called at this time to serve the state and lead the people. I don't think there is a contradiction in having prayers for both the protector, who was a regicide, and having a prayer for the reigning monarch. Amen. The impact of the Civil War, the tide of blood, the regicide, all the overturning, had a lasting effect on the British and the English psyche. It makes us shy away from civil war, it makes us shy away from extremism. So we're a broad church and we're inclusive. Within two years of Cromwell's death, the monarchy was restored. A cavalier triumph but the new constitution placed significant limits on royal power. The Roundheads had put Britain on the road to parliamentary democracy. If we look at the 21st century, I think we're a republic in all but name. Uh, of course, we have a queen, we'll soon have uh, King Charles III. Uh, but in fact, they have no power, and I think this is the legacy of the Roundheads. A 
Over 350 years after the Civil War came to an end, Roundhead values have even infiltrated the royal family. The Queen herself, it seems to me, is by instinct a sort of roundhead. Dutiful, she knows the rules, she, she abides by a code of behaviour that is very precise and, 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 and very austere in some ways. I mean, she lives a sort of a very careful life, whereas Prince Charles, it seems to me, is sort of King Charles again. I mean, he, there is somebody we understand to put toothpaste on his toothbrush. This is a man who probably does deep down believe in the divine right of kings. Centuries of conflict have had a surprising effect on the British character. It now seems there's a little bit of roundhead and cavalier in us all. In some ways, it's a sort of strangely self-defining aspect of our politics, that people feel they're slotted into one or the other, and then spend quite a lot of time trying to, trying to break the mould. Um, I think, fascinatingly, at the moment, we probably have a prime minister who is, by instinct, a cavalier, but realises that the whole Bullingdon Club, um, let your hair down, um, person who is kind of born to rule, it is a very dangerous aspect of his perhaps unfair public persona. So Cameron spends a great deal of his time, I think, trying to play down the cavalier aspects of his image and trying to play up the roundhead ones. Conversely, Ed Miliband seems to me to be probably a natural roundhead. He is somebody who seems to me to have a very clear and crisp set of ideas of where he wants to go. On the other hand, he's fighting the perception that actually he's very boring. I think the Cavaliers did win. We have a society which is a pyramid of snobbery and wealth. Um, that seems to me a Cavalier Britain. We are definitely getting more Cavalier. We are, we are now getting more Cavalier, and that's not a good thing. There are no roundheads telling you what to do and what not to do. You're encouraged to be a cavalier and just get on with it on your own. But actually, most people are now suddenly realising you've got to have a bit of roundhead backbone in your cavalier existence or else it all implodes. I think over the last few decades, we've probably become a more roundhead society. I think we are much more carefully controlled. There are many more CCTV cameras around that I think Oliver Cromwell and his like would certainly have approved of. Um, on the other hand, I think as a reaction to that, when the cavalier spirit breaks out, it breaks out with all feathers on. Um, and so I think in a way we've probably become more extreme in both aspects of the national character. Roundhead or cavalier? The battle continues. Coming up next week, a brand new series sees Lucy Worsley chart a 17th century history for girls. Harlots, Housewives and Heroines begins on Tuesday at 9. Next tonight here on BBC4, though, catch up with our drama with part one of Birdsong. <laughs>